rest on this day set aside. Uh, a day for rest, a day for worship, uh, a day for our souls to especially uh, focus on delighting in you. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, as we continue to think through the, the history of, uh, as recorded in the scriptures, Lord, that we would think of, of history from your vantage point, from the vantage point of your redemptive plans being worked out in time and history and, and in your people, in your covenant community, and ultimately in your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so let's do a quick little review here. Um, where, where, where did we get to? We got through Ruth, okay, which was what period of time? Judges. Judges. So let's go back. What's the first period of time that we studied? Creation. Creation, that's right. And you can then package there creation and sort of the pre-fall period, right? Before the fall. So then what did we, what period was after that? Patriarchs. The patriarchs before uh, the patriarchs. I, when I hear patriarchs, I think Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Well, there's a good bit before. What else? Jill. What's that? I heard too many people at once here. My eyes or ears are... Jim? No. No, okay, good. Now, what I'll call that, there's a little boys we can call it, but we'll call it the, the pre-diluvian period. Diluvian, that's flood language, right? So before the flood, so after the fall, before the flood, which Noah is kind of that, has a foot in both, right? Uh, and then uh, you have the post-flood period, which is from Noah up to the patriarchs. And then you got the patriarchs of, of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, of course, Jacob and his 12 sons, especially with an emphasis on, on Joseph. And so I mentioned Joseph. What period of time should we think about when I mentioned Joseph? Egypt, right? The descent into <clears throat> Egypt. They sojourn in Egypt for a time. And at first they come in rather gloriously, and then they end up enslaved. And so then what, what period does that bring us to? Exodus, Exodus led by who? Moses. Moses, that's right, Moses in the Exodus. And so then they have that period of the wilderness wandering, 40 years. And what then happened at the end of that wilderness wandering? What period is that referred to? Start with the C. Conquest. conquest, that's right, the conquest led by who? Joshua. Joshua. And um, then there was a long period of time, which we've been studying the last few weeks. Time of the Judges, that's right. And so Ruth is uh, a book that dealt with that time of the Judges. That's what we got through last time. Uh, technically, as we begin today, uh, we're still on the tail end of the time of the Judges. But really, I'm, I'm referring to today's uh, lesson as the rise of the United Kingdom. Or, and I don't mean Britain. Uh, but uh, uh, this is in, in contrast the United Kingdom versus um, the divided kingdom afterwards, right? When north and south, you got Israel and Judah. That's the time we're studying in First Kings. So we're getting really close to the period of time that we're going through in our Sunday sermon. And so uh, today, the United Kingdom is going to have its first king, right? You don't have a kingdom without a king, right? So the first king is going to be Saul. But we're not there quite, quite yet. Uh, we've got uh, in our list of judges, we've got two more judges to get through that aren't in the book of Judges, uh, but are in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. And uh, 1 Samuel starts out with uh, a judge named Eli. He is uh, judging Israel at Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was. That's where the Ark of uh, the Covenant was. Um, I think this is an important uh, thing to, to note when we think of, in contrast to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's where the Ark ultimately ends up. That's where the temple ends up. But first, uh, the Ark and the tabernacle, the tent version of the temple, was at Shiloh. And um, here Eli is judging Israel there. He's also uh, serving uh, as, a, as a priest in the, in the temple or the tabernacle there. 
And when you look at Eli himself, he doesn't himself per se to be, seem to be too bad of a judge. And, I, and I, I say that in contrast to things like Samson uh, or, or some of these other judges that we saw seem to have a lot of uh, moral failings. But Eli does have one major blight on his record that scripture emphasizes. What was the major blight? Anybody remember right here? Although he reprimanded his sons, he did not restrain them. Yeah, so he had uh, two sons, uh, Hophni and Phinehas. Spell that uh, E-H-A. Phinehas. And um, they were wicked sons. Uh, in fact, let's turn to First uh, Samuel two twelve. Thomas, what kind of men were they? First Samuel two twelve. Sons of Belial. Ah oh, yes. <laughs> so ESV in, in a less colorful translation says they were worthless men. Uh, they did uh, not know uh, the Lord. Uh, so, literally, they're, they're, they're sons of, of, of the evil one, right? Uh, and so, these, uh, their, their sin, we get then told as we keep reading. So, look at verse 13. I'll, I'll read it. It says, the, the custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept well meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, then take as much as you wish, he would say no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. So we have to remember, God cares very much that his worship is done in the way he tells it. Right? Uh, I know we, we bring this out a lot, the whole notion of the, the regulative principle of worship. And when we think of uh, evil actions uh, today, moral moral failings, uh, probably deviations from specific statements of worship are not the first thing that pop in people's mind. But but notice, like when it describes the evil of these people, uh, first and foremost, it, it goes into the way that they were perverting the worship of the Lord, of the offering of the Lord. There were very specific requirements for how they were to handle these kinds of offerings. One of them being specifically the idea of that they weren't to eat the fat. They were supposed to burn the fat up. And uh, the fat was supposed to be offered to the Lord. And so, um, of course, we all know maybe you all have that prime rib, right, and that big strip of fat. It's really tasty. It's horribly bad for you. But uh, they wanted to eat the fat, evidently. And so um, this is an example of some of the, the, the abuses that are, that are said here. And um, look then... How, how God holds Eli accountable, who is supposed to be the high priest. First Samuel, keep reading down to verse 29. Why then do you scorn my sacrifice? He's talking to Eli here. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? So he didn't discipline them and prevent them from doing this. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, we see elsewhere he does speak out against a, 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 a rebuke actually in the middle there, but but he doesn't actually s stop them from doing this and doesn't actually discipline them for doing it. And so uh, it's a sin of omission on him for not properly uh, uh, disciplining, not only as a parent, but as a high priest. And so interestingly, in, in verse 29, right, God holds him accountable, Eli as honoring his sons above the Lord. And, and so this is really the thing that's painted negatively about Eli's house, such that uh, elsewhere in, in, in this passage we see 
God's punishment is that Eli's house is going to eventually be uh, removed from the priesthood, and another son of Aaron is going to be, uh, another descendants from Aaron are going to be, become the new priesthood uh, within uh, uh, Israel. And so uh, I, I paint this just to kind of flavor the time a little bit. We've got this, this judge, Eli, who had this major blight on his record. And um, uh, the maybe the, arguably the, the most tragic thing, though, that happens under Eli's uh, tenure as judge is found uh, in, in just a, a couple chapters here. And we'll come back and talk about Samuel in a moment here. But um, it's in chapter 4. Uh, the Philistines capture the ark. We had started to see the Philistines rise up as an enemy toward the end of the book of Judges. Remember, uh, Samson battled with the Philistines. And the Philistines are going to continue to be a big enemy for Israel uh, for, for a while here in the history as we're going through it. And um, here, uh, in one of the battles, uh, you get the sense that Israel wants to sort of treat the ark almost like, like a like a magic item, you know, like they they need victory over um, the Philistines, and so they say we better bring the ark into the battle with us. Now, the notion of God going with you in battle, absolutely a good notion, right? But the problem was the text paints it is that. The reason God really wasn't going with them in battles because they were they were sinning, they were uh, disobeying the Lord, they weren't keeping the covenant as they should, and so it's like bringing the ark is as if they could bring God with them when they weren't right with the Lord, and so instead of the ark giving them victory, they have a major defeat. Eli's sons die in battle. Eli hears about the word, and it almost sounds like like that news itself was not as to him as shocking as what then, then what happened was that the ark also got captured and that's what really uh, 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 shocked uh, Eli and um, the the wife of uh, Phineas uh, has her son the same day that they that they lose in battle and lose the ark and that son gets named Ichabod Ichabod which means no glory and so this is really a shame, shameful time for Israel's history. Jim? A, a lot of people, and, and Christians included, seem to believe that the Ark had some magical powers. The Ark had nothing as far as it was a, a, an example of the presence of God. So the Ark, without obedience, is nothing. Yeah. And, and the, the idea of going into battle with the Ark as if it's some type of talisman is turning it into an, an idol. And you can go to the, take the ark to the battle in disobedience, and what happens? It proves that it, it has no power in and of itself. It's kind of like hypothetically, if someone were to take the bread of, of communion and somehow attach some magical power to it in and of itself, exactly. instead of it being um, sacramentally a blessing to those who receive it, you exactly. hopefully caught my, my little snide right. comment there. Uh, you know, it's it, the analogy there, right? The bread uh, in, in the false teaching of, of transubstantiation that Roman Catholics believe is essentially makes the bread a magic, a mm -hmm. magic item because in and of itself it's transformed exactly. in their mind to the body of Christ and inherently of value to take it. And we would say, no, it, it remains bread and the cup remains wine. Uh, as we take it in faith, because God said he would bless those who come in a worthy fashion to partake, then, 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 yeah, we're blessed. And the same thing is true with that ark. It was significant in a huge way. It was the footstool of God's presence on earth, and it was a a, 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 a real uh, representative way in which God was present among the people. But only in so far as they that they treated it in faith for what it represented, and not as a magic item that was. Ex operata, in a sense, uh, exactly. and and we see that when they abused it and you know didn't follow the provisions, right? And later, uh, when it was being transported, right, uh, Uzzah touches it, it gets killed, right? Uh, so these things God would would use as He you know instituted, and not that they weren't meant to be treated as as sort of uh, magic magic items, right? Um, so good.
So, uh, in contrast to this more infamous aspect of Eli, by the way, uh, I guess in case you're not familiar with this, we're going through the history, uh, even though the Philistines captured the ark, it caused them a lot of trouble. Uh, curses were brought upon them, and they finally, uh, this is my quick summary, but they finally realized, we got to get this ark out of town. It's caused us nothing but trouble. And so they sent it on a, on, I believe, a, 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 a new cart with some goats or camel or a donkey or something. No, no, no it was two, two cattle. Cattle, thank you, that thank had, you. That had just had calves. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and so they uh, sent it off. Back toward Israel, mm -hmm. and it eventually made its way back to Israel, and Israel reclaimed and, it. And that was that was a way that God showed His sovereignty over everything. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. So, in contrast to this rather bleak part of Eli's history, uh, one thing that does get uh, positive of uh, we used of Eli is uh, he would be the one to to raise up Samuel. What happened was you might remember Hannah. Uh, Hannah was uh, uh, a woman that we don't learn a whole lot about, but uh, she's mentioned at the beginning of 1 Samuel, and she's barren. And she goes at Shiloh at the, at the tabernacle there and prays unto the Lord that if God would give her a son, that uh, she would dedicate that son to the Lord. And sure enough, God answers that prayer, and that's prayer, that, that son is, is Samuel, and she dedicates Samuel as soon as he was old enough to be weaned and whatnot to be delivered there to Eli at the, at the tabernacle. And um, uh, Samuel uh, began to live there at the tabernacle and be uh, under the, the, the uh, caretaking of Eli. And he was a servant there at the tabernacle. And interesting, and you look at Hannah, uh, she sings a song uh, in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. And it's a very beautiful song, and uh, there's a lot of reversal language in her song that God's going to reverse the, the fortunes of Israel from bad to good. And ending in uh, the song there in verse 10 uh, of chapter 2, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king. And exalt the horn of his anointed. What seems weird about that statement? They don't have a king. They don't have a king. That's right. And so in beautiful uh, prophetic uh, uh, language here, uh, the Lord is, is predicting a reversal that would happen through a coming king, which, of course, the whole book of 1 Samuel is really about the rise of the Davidic kingdom. And how first, of course, they get... Saul king, that doesn't work out so well, but then David comes. And interestingly, Hannah's song, thematically, is very similar to the song of Mary in Luke's gospel. And I think we should definitely see parallel and connection there. Um, in other words, Mary's song, right, um, is referencing how the ultimate fulfillment of even Hannah's song uh, came not in, the, not in David, but in in Jesus. Jesus is the one who would give reversal, right? Uh, think, think of uh, um, all the reversals that are in like the, the Beatitudes, right? You know, those who are uh, uh, have, you know, not experienced this will experience that. There's, there's, there's reversal, right? Uh, uh, so that's what Christ does. He, he gives us, takes us from sin and death and brings us to life and and, and, and justification righteousness another historical aspect of it is how God uses what um, another um, sermon I heard that God uses cross hand um, uplifting in other words the firstborn in the in the patriarchs was supposed to have the most the right first mm -hmm. right birthright and so on mm -hmm. and so forth but God uses he crosses his hands and he picks the second one yeah, with uh, you know. Jacob and yeah. as well as Jacob and Esau, and then yeah. with um, the next two, uh, Verse, Joseph's sons, Ephraim versus and Manasseh. What the, versus what the, what the Pharisees and, and the uh, Sadducees would expect, all the righteous, you know, the self-righteous would be the, the one. The self-righteous, that's right? right, yeah. Yeah, that's a, uh, an important aspect of, of um, the unexpected. And even, uh, so not only from the Jews' perspective, you know, who they thought were really right with the Lord, but then the same... 
you know, Paul uses that same idea with the Gentiles, the foolishness versus the wisdom, right? And uh, uh, the, the Gentiles who think, the, you know, they are so wise and whatnot, and they think us so foolish to put our hope in the cross, in a, in a, in a man who died on the cross, right? Uh, how he reverses that. Uh, even the turn the table notion we will see later in Esther when we get there with Haman, the tables are turned on him. So God's a, God does a lot of reversals in the scriptures. Um, okay, so uh, here with uh, Samuel. Um, Samuel is a very important figure. Um, in many ways, if you think about key prophetic times in Israel's history, key prophets, uh, you got Moses, and I'd say the next real significant prophet in Israel's history is, is Samuel. Uh, probably the next one would be really um, like Elijah. Not to say there aren't prophets in between. There definitely are. Nathan is a big example. We'll talk about Nathan. But, but in terms of key prophets, uh, Samuel is a key prophet. Uh, what you find, though, is Samuel's definitely a prophet. He also serves as a priest with Eli in the temple. And um, he's also described as a judge, which is very similar to a king. So, you know, in the prophet-priest-king idea, uh, you know, he, he really embodies the three main options, prophet, priest, and judge. And then he's also very much seen as not only prophet, priest, and judge, but he's also the kingmaker. He anoints the first two kings, uh, the first two Christs in Israel's history. And as a judge, he really uh, reverses that downward spiral of, of worse and worse judges. Um, Samuel is painted very positively as a, a judge, um, arguably the most commendable of all Israel's judges, which is kind of interesting uh, that it's in his time that uh, uh, they end up de demanding a king. Though, to be fair, uh, in 1 Samuel 8, we learn that Samuel's own sons uh, were also, quote, unworthy, uh, that uh, that becomes the context uh, for the people asking for a king. Uh, in 1 Samuel 8, 2, we see that, uh, uh, or 8, 3, we see that his sons uh, took bribes and perverted justice. And um, it's at that they say, Behold, you are old, talking to Samuel, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Like all the nations. That's unfortunately the... Uh, the bad part of their request there. Uh, they, they don't want just a king. They want a king like all the nations. And think of Israel, right? Israel's supposed to be holy, a holy nation. They're supposed to be distinct from all the nations. Uh, they're, they're, you know, you've seen the, the shirts, right? The Christian shirts with all the fish going one way and the Christian fish going the other way, right? They're supposed to swim the opposite way, right? This is, they're supposed to be not like all the other nations. Well, here they want to be like all the other nations. And um, so look at 1 Samuel 8, 6, and 7. What Samuel evidently thought of their request Sarah Miller, why don't you read 1 Samuel 8, 6, and 7. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So interestingly, we learn here by God's words what Samuel's reaction was. What was Samuel's reaction Internally, what was going on in his human heart when uh, he was uh, heard this request for for a king? They rejected me. Yeah, he took it personally. He's like, they're rejecting me as a judge by asking for a king. It's like evidently they didn't appreciate my ministry or something like that. But God explains to Samuel, it's not you they're rejecting; it's me. Because remember, this is that theme we've been talking about. Who was to be the king for God's people? And we said, on the one hand, there's this notion we saw in the book of Judges of everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. Why? Because there was no king. On the other hand, also in the book of Judges, like what Gideon said, God was supposed to be their king. This tension, and even the fact that 
Deuteronomy allowed in the law for a king with certain guidelines. And so there's this tension. And here, the tension about God being their king, that's what, that's what um, God says to Samuel, that this represented a failing of the people. By the way they were asking was, was such that they were rejecting God as king. And I think it's brought out as we keep looking here that it's especially because of the kind of king that they were asking for. They weren't asking for a king who would reign after God's own heart. They were asking for a king like all the other nations. And so God says, amazingly, you can give them the king they want, but first warn them. And so uh, that's what Samuel goes about doing. God has Samuel warn the people, if you get this kind of king, here's what it'll be like. And you find this in chapter 8, um, verses 11 on, goes through the, the, the different warnings. And you see things like the king will do things like conscripting people into language, taxation, uh, put you in a place of servitude, place a heavy burden upon you as he exalts himself, he will humble you. And so these are the kinds of sorts of troubles that will come. Sound familiar? Uh, these things still are, are representative in, in, in heavy governments uh, today. And so the one that God has Samuel uh, give them at first, anoint them, is Saul, who is a king like all the other nations in this sense. Uh, when God tells him and shows him Saul, Saul looks very kingly. Outwardly, he's, he's taller than everyone else, right? He, he, he looks like a big, strong, strapping young man. And so God has, has a, a Samuel as kingmaker to anoint uh, Saul as, as king. Now, let's see here. How are we doing on time? Um, let me... Put up here a few, a few things as we begin to talk about Saul here. So again, the the rise of King Saul. We're looking somewhere around 1050 BC, and uh, this is the United Kingdom, right? This is going to be for all 12 tribes. Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. About that. Yeah. I've always thought it interesting. I mean, this is not very far removed from the shame of Benjamin, right? I mean, you know, we just talked last week about their whole issue with uh, the city of Benjamin that got wiped out and all. And now we have a king coming from Benjamin. Is there any, would we put it, I mean, and Saul obviously is ultimately not the anointed, you know, the godly king. Would we put any more emphasis on that? I mean, I just, I just find that to be interesting. So let me ask a question because I, I, as I, you were talking, I was already starting to think of the answer, and then I think I missed an important part of your question. So you were saying uh, the the shame of Benjamin. What what was the connection you said of the shame of Benjamin? Uh, last week we talked about how the there was the city that uh, committed the heinous act against oh, oh, you know, oh. and, and then Benjamin was almost wiped out, uh, but you know they went and got daughters for them from the neighboring towns or you know people. And it just seemed to me that, that this is very close on the heels of that. I mean, maybe it's a couple hundred years, I don't so, know. So that's an interesting question. Um, and you very well may be on to some thought. I will also give you a, a, a speculative thought on my own uh, that, that maybe is not any better or worse. But uh, uh, I pointed out Shiloh, which is in Ephraim. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm recalling um, Joshua, was of the tribe of, of Ephraim? Is that right? Does that sound right? Um, at any rate, uh, you get the sense from a psalm later on that, you know, Ephraim, which is of the tribe of Joseph, right, ultimately, is given a chance to, to be the center of, of leadership and fails. So Joseph as a tribe fails. The natural pick is what? To go to, to Judah. Well, no. Uh, the natural pick might be who is the second born of the most favored, favored son is Benjamin. Um, when that fails, you ran out of you ran out of favored wife sons. 
Uh, well, you go over to the other tribe. You got Reuben. You can't do Reuben. Uh, Reuben got in trouble, right? Uh, uh, Simeon likewise. Uh, so then you're left with Levi as the third in line. Well, Levi had a special place. Levi set apart. So then next in line would be Judah. So that's where we'll get to Judah. So I, I, I think there's something along those lines. I think Benjamin was the next tribe in line to get, get a shot at leadership, I think. It's something along those, those lines. There's a man in the New Testament also named Saul of the tribe of Benjamin. And yeah. prior to meeting Christ, he certainly is, typifies the old man, doesn't mm. he? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin of Benjamin, yes. After Ephraim, why would, the, why would it not next go to his brother Manasseh. Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I think in, in Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh kind of come as a package. Okay. Ephraim is the uh, the first, the actually not the firstborn, but made firstborn in terms of inheritance. Yeah. And again, that's just a, the, the scripture doesn't exactly paint it in explicit terms in this regard, but but I do think there's something to observe there in terms of how the the tribal orders uh, worked itself out. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe to point out, uh, let's see, are we on time? Um, at this time, so we've got the main prophet, uh, so we got the king, uh, we got a, a, a prophet here, is um, Samuel, is the main prophet we see at this time, and um, uh, we can also find, we're going to see there's a minor role of a prophet named Gad um, that happens in Saul's life. Uh, other key players uh, during uh, this time frame um, are Jonathan. This is the son of Saul. He's, so that makes him prince, right? And there is David. Even though we're talking about Saul, a lot of Saul's history is as a David is, is on the rise. Um, and he'll be the next king after Saul, of course. And then uh, major enemies... We have um, the Philistines. They would be enemy number one at this time. Uh, 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 another one we need to mention, it comes important in the history of Saul, is the Amalekites. And you might recall God had put a, a, a sanction against Amalekites, uh, a very strong issue of wipe them out uh, back during the, the wilderness wandering time. And that plays into the history of Saul as well. So... God has Samuel anoint Saul, a king like all the other nations. And um, he is a legitimate king at that point, right? He's anointed and declared king. And this is very important. Uh, it's in 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be <laughs> prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord. You will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And so he's anointed. Uh, you then see Samuel gathers the people together at Mizpah. They, he presents the king, uh, 1 Samuel 10, 24. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the peoples. And the people shouted, Long live the king. But then you keep reading and you see that there's some worthless men who aren't, uh, aren't so sure about this Saul guy. And uh, they, they raise some grumblings uh, against uh, the people uh, about the notion of making Saul king. And so what we uh, find then is um, he has a rather memorable victory at the beginning over the Ammonites. I know they're not listed up there on the enemy chart. They're also an enemy uh, who liberates the town of Jabesh Gilead, which this plays into the history you were talking about, Thomas, a moment ago. Jabesh Gilead, that was the town where they got the Benjamite wives. And uh, the Ammonites afflicted Jabesh Gilead. And um, Saul comes to their rescue. And it's in that initial victory where then those worthless men who spoke against having Saul as a king were were, were silenced, and um, they come in chapter 11, Samuel gathers them now back again, this time at Gilgal, and they renew the kingdom and have a big celebration, and they, they offer peace offerings to the Lord, 
And that's when, really at that point, Saul has sort of solidified his reign over the whole nation, putting uh, to uh, silence the, the naysayers uh, at his time. Um, so let's see here. What's also important to note in, in 1 Samuel 11 there, when he has that victory over uh, the, the Ammonites, he even mentions the Spirit of God coming upon him, very much like we saw with some of the judges, where the judges are described as having the Spirit of God come upon them. So in many ways, Saul's beginning starts out very positively. And I think I want us to very much understand this, is while God ultimately knew that Saul was not going to be ultimately showing himself to be the king after God's own heart, wasn't going to ultimately be the kind of king that people actually really needed, there's a sense in which he had a real chance <laughs> uh, from, from a human vantage point to actually go and do the right thing and lead the people in righteousness the way a king should have led the people. And so I want us to go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy um, 17. I've mentioned a lot as we've been going through 1 Kings, Deuteronomy 17. And this is the passage that gives the instructions in the law for what the king was supposed to be like if they had a king among Israel. So Deuteronomy 17, uh, if you notice there, uh, the Pew Bible's tra or, uh, title, verse 14, saying, Laws Concerning Israel's Kings. And so, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Brooke, can you uh, read verses uh, 14 through 17? When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. How far am I going? Okay. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Good. And Jeff, read verses 18 through 20. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book, a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priest. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes, and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. This is such an important passage for us, not only for today, but as we keep going through Kings, it's why I keep referencing it, and I want to make sure you, you read it here again today, because this is the standard, sort of the starting place when you're analyzing a king in Israel's history. Do they follow, do they match up with this or not, right? Unfortunately, they often do match up with it in the sense of all the things it says not to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's, there's them acquiring lots of horses. Oh, even from Egypt, right? And, uh, oh, there's them having lots of wives, right? The things that they said not to do, right? The whole notion of uh, verse 20, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers. See, the idea is it's supposed to be first among equals. Right? Like we're all supposed to be brothers and sisters in the Lord. And yeah, as king, you've got a, 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 the, the job, the burden of, of leadership. But it's not like king up here and everyone else under my feet. That's not the way it was supposed to be in Israel. That's the way it is in the nation's kings, right? That the king exalts himself and lowers the people. But that's not the way that they were supposed to rule. More so, he's supposed to have its own personal Bible. Now, we take that for granted because we all are like kings nowadays and have our own personal Bibles. We should be ashamed for not reading it enough, right? 
uh, we, we were like royalty in that regard. But he was supposed to have his own copy of the law approved by Levitical priests. He's supposed to uh, read it every day. He's supposed to learn uh, about what God wants so that he can then use that in his rule. Right? Will he rule the people according to the law? And that's why you know, this little section uh, becomes a placeholder for the whole word of God. Right? Because it's saying he needs to have the word of God and, and rule the people by it. And so as Israel now goes into a, a, a monarchy, into a kingdom, right? Because they have a king now. Will the king, will King Saul rule like this? Will he keep these things and have his kingdom established? We'll have to come back next week and find out. <laughs> We're out of time. Let, let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, though surely most if not all of us know how King Saul's uh, history comes out, Lord, we, we do pray uh, that we would learn lessons from uh, his, his reign, even as we continue to look at it next week. Uh, we, we thank you that uh, the good and bad kings in Israel's history point us to the need for the one perfect king in King Jesus. And uh, we hail him again uh, today, and we ask that as we take our break now, we prepare... Uh, for that worship that we would conduct in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray this now in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.